Hi. Um, first, let me begin this uh, video with a, a warning label. Uh, if you're craving visual excitement, this is not the video that will provide it. It's going to be absolutely boring, for in it, what you will see, as my title suggests, is an elderly, superannuated perhaps, if not senile, uh, Orthodox Jewish political science professor reading an open letter to my college community and administration that I composed. Um, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about myself and my college and my reasons for uh, composing this letter and reading it to you. After I'm finished, I'll explain a little bit about uh, what I intended in the letter and, uh, and hope to make it clearer and to also to avoid some misunderstandings. Um, who am I? I'm a 68-year-old, as I said, Orthodox Jewish professor. Uh, I, uh, I have been an academic all my life. There was a short stint in graduate school when I was a head flusher at a slaughterhouse and cut 900 cow heads off a day. I often joke that I used to be a head flusher, now I'm a brainwasher. You're supposed to laugh at that. Um, but at any rate, in addition to my being an ap academic, probably the other interesting aspect of my life is the accidental and side life of my um, adult existence. Um, and that is... Um, after I converted to Judaism at the age of 18, after having become interested in it at the age of 14, I, um, my life followed uh, the path of an itinerant academic. I taught at six different colleges, including an after-graduate school, and lived in major cities all over the United States, Chicago, New York, Washington, DeKalb, Illinois, the location of Northern Illinois University. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And... Um, uh, and because I have uh, some gift at languages, I learned Hebrew easily, and I've loved it ever since, I, um, I have the habits of a scholar, if not the discipline of a scholar, so I never had any problem reading uh, liturgical texts or history or um, theological treatises, and my academic background partially is in political philosophy, so I've never been unfamiliar with the great issues raised in theological treatises. And because I have some singing voice, I won't say that I have singing, singing talent. I've often told people that I would, you could probably describe my cantorial techniques as somebody who has been trained at the Ethel Merman School of Cantorial Squawking. But as a result, and following my academic career, I often lived in small towns uh, that did not have extensively large Jewish communities or much Jewish talent or leadership. So as a result, I was often... Uh, propelled to uh, positions of Jewish leadership. So I described the other part of my life as as uh, an accidental rabbi, even though I'm not ordained. I've performed five weddings, 17 funerals, the last one of a young man who had been murdered in Charlotte. I've had 54 bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah students run two religious schools and served as the um, uh, non-ordained official and unofficial rabbinic leadership in three congregations. Why do I say that? Because that other part of my life has brought me in touch with much of life and living that I would never have fully understood it had I simply been an academic. I think I would have lived a rich and full and enjoyable life as an academic, and I have. Um, but let me say that when you devote yourself to sitting in the company of a mother for three hours in order to learn details of her murdered son so that you can provide the eulogy and the funeral the next day. When you marry uh, uh, people and, uh, and launch them on, God willing, a, a life of marital happiness, um, when you conduct the circumcision of a son or a 15-year-old, as I've done that too, um, and when you have, in other words, walked through the valley of sorrows and the mountains of joys with your fellow human beings, it teaches you something about life that the simple study of academic philosophy and subjects can't. Um, 
And with respect to the issues that I'm going to talk about, I have to say that, that um, for instance, when I was the, un the official non-ordained part-time rabbi in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where my college is located, I probably spoke at 20 to 30 uh, different denominations of churches representing both myself as a professor, but also the Jewish community. And, uh, um, and for instance, I had m many interchanges with pastors and ministers of every imaginable faith and racial identification. And, and you learn something about life in that sense, too. So excuse my boring journey as I read through my open letter to my college. Now, a, a little bit about my academic life. I, I uh, attended Northern Illinois University where I obtained a, a BA and, a, and an MA in political science and then followed one of my great professors who moved to the University of Virginia in 1977 uh, to finish my PhD in ancient and modern political philosophy, uh, constitutional law and American political thought, American politics and institutions, and and that is where I have uh, followed the bulk of my scholarly and teaching interests in my teaching at uh, full time teaching at uh, Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, Carleton College in Minnesota, uh, William and Mary in uh, Williamsburg, Hampton Sydney College in Farmville, Virginia. I just love the name of that town. And of course, uh, Congress College in Spartanburg. Um, my college is a small, private, all women's liberal arts college of about a thousand students. I have to tell you a little bit about it because you'll understand some of the things to which I refer in my letter. Uh, it is about to change its name to Converse University because it is adding some graduate programs, I think some PhD programs in education, and perhaps more consequential is uh, it is becoming co-ed. It is adding men to its undergraduate student body. So it's, 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 it's going to become a quite different institution, a fact to which I'll refer for obvious reasons later. Um, what led me to compose this letter was the administration and academic leadership of my college um, in response to the horrific events of the last several weeks, beginning with the uh, uh, sickening death uh, of uh, George Floyd and culminating in the chaos, as I will describe it, uh, which unfolded, my, the leadership of my college issued some s statements with which I disagreed vis-a-vis -vis the interpretation of the events that overwhelmed America and and uh, uh, left no aspect of American life unturned almost. Moreover, in reacting to uh, Floyd's murder and the aftermath, our leadership imposed the mandatory viewing and checking off of several diversity and inclusion bias and racism videos. Now, I know that that wouldn't have killed me, uh, and um, uh, but I have to say that uh, it was the fact that they imposed this on us and made it a mandate rather than recommending or th that actually really generated the letter. This is an open letter to, to them and my community, and in some ways the outside world, which justifies my uh, broadcasting it through this video, so to speak. And I'll say one other thing, and this is pertinent to uh, some of the substantive points I try to make in my letter, in which I'll um, uh, explain a little bit more fully afterwards. Um, I love my country, and always have. Uh, I inherited... Uh, uh, this love of country, this intense patriotism from my mother and father um, who fought bravely in World War II and my parents were poor Midwesterners uh, who uh, uh, even through the turbulence of, of some aspects of poverty and, um, and economic deprivation nevertheless loved America beyond description. I inherited that. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why I've spent my academic life studying America's principles, its founding, and its institutions. I like to say I'm very patriotic. And if I were a stand-up Jewish comedian, uh, 
uh, at a at a comedy club, and I said, "I'm so patriotic." Obviously, some prompt in the audience would say, "How patriotic are you?" Uh, this will give you some sense. Um, I know all four verses of the Star Spangled Banner and can recite from memory Ella Lazarus's poem at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Um, one time after I'd bought a new car and was commuting, since I now live in Charlotte, and was commuting to, commuting to Spartanburg in my new car, I was singing, as I often do, because I love the our national anthem, all four verses and and becoming overcome by motion, and I was stopped for speeding the moment I crossed over the South Carolina border. And, and the policeman, after I rolled the window down, asked the question they always ask. Sir, do you know how fast you were going? And I had to say, no, officer, I, I don't. He said, why don't you? And I said, I was weeping. He looked a little curious, and he said, why were you weeping? And I said, well, I was singing all four verses of the Star Spangled Banner, and I always get emotional. And he looked at me, and he said, there are not four verses of the Star Spangled Banner. So, of course, I sang them for him there, and he let me go without a ticket. I'm not going to sing all four verses of the Star Spangled Banner for you, lest I be arrested as a public nuisance. So, what I will do is read my letter. So, um, here is the letter. It is entitled, See Clearly, Decide Wisely, Act Justly, an open letter to the Converse College community. As you will discover, by the way, uh, that phrase, See Clearly, Decide Wisely, Act Justly, was the founder of Converse's college's model for the college. Our, and it's called our founder's ideal or principle, Dexter Edgar Congress, Con Converse, who founded the school and, and after which it was named after him uh, in, in uh, uh, 1889. So, um, to the board of trustees and administration and the faculty and staff, uh, present and former students of Converse College and to the public beyond the college. On June 2nd, 3rd and 5th, 2020, President Newkirk, Provost Barker, and Chair of the Converse College Board of Visitors, or uh, Trustees, Phyllis Perrin Harris, respectively, issued passionate and anguished statements following the killing of George Floyd, and laid out a series of measures to demonstrate the college's seriousness in addressing the existence of racism and racial bigotry here and in the nation. Among those measures, they included the mandatory viewing of several videos that purport to address the issues of sensitivity, bias, prejudice, diversity, and inclusion. My purpose in addressing the members of the college community is to inform them and you that I cannot and I will not comply with this mandate and to, in this letter, explain to them and you the reasons for my decision. When I viewed the video of Mr. Floyd's sickening death, I, like all Americans of goodwill, was horrified. But as the days and weeks unfolded, and the ensuing protests were accompanied and overwhelmed by atrocity, mayhem, rioting, looting, and yet more murder, I was still more horrified by the images unfolding in my country as they increasingly came to re resemble what Jews have always called pogroms. By way of explanation, the word pogrom is a Russian word. Uh, in Jewish history, it refers to an anti-Jewish riot in which a mob would uh, commit arson, mayhem, looting, violence, and murder. In modern history, uh, so of course, aside from the Holocaust, and the systemic horrors of Soviet oppression. Um, uh, probably the three most famous pogroms uh, in Jewish history in the 20th century were in 1905 and 1907 in Russia, in which hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered, and thousands of Jewish businesses and places of worship and business were destroyed. And again in 1907, and of course on November 9th, uh, 19. 38 Kristallnacht, in which the Nazi government engineered uh, a nationwide uh, orgy of violence against the Jewish community. So this is what I mean when I say the images in America began to look what Jews have always called pogroms. That explains that term. I was horrified, too, by the apparent indifference 
and even encouragement of the chaos by politicians, journalists, celebrities, and yes, the leadership of the academic world. Even as the violence consumed the lives and livelihoods of scores of African-American communities and their inhabitants. One thing that we heard during this time was, quote unquote, silence is complicity. This phrase was invoked in order to lay blame on those who consciously or unconsciously enabled, quote unquote, systemic racism to exist in our police departments and in the lives and institutions of the nation at large by refusing to acknowledge and denounce it. Evidently responding to the need to denounce racism rather than be complicit in it, President Newkirk's Provost Barker's and Chairperson Harris's statements contained angry condemnations of Mr. Floyd's and others' killings by the police. They pledged to address, individually and collectively, inside the college and outside of it, the systemic racism which they perceive and to craft measures to eliminate it, including, of course, the coercive mandate with which I take issue. Yet, all of their statements were strangely silent on the horrors that engulfed and continued to engulf the innumerable African-American communities and the scores of American cities that lay in ruins after the violence and chaos took their toll. They expressed anguish over the loss of Mr. Floyd's life, but not a word over the murder of David Dorn, the former police captain of St. Louis who perished at the hands of looters. Our leaders profess that black lives matter, but is it all black lives or only some black lives that matter to them? Perhaps they are only concerned about the loss of the black lives that confirms their political narrative and supports their progressive ideology. Perhaps black lives, but not black livelihoods, matter to them. I must uh, cite my sources. That refers to a cartoon in the Washington Examiner by the cartoonist Jim Bob uh, on uh, June 9th, 2020, on page 9. Were their urgent declamations merely panicked virtual signaling to themselves, the college, the community, and the outside world? And if you want to follow the reference I make here, uh, there was a fine article called The Mandatory Banality of University Presidents by the head of the National Association of Scholars, Peter Wood, published on its website on 6 to, uh, 2020 Or were these statements of my college leadership genuinely anguished and sincere proclamations grounded in real moral outrage and aimed at systemic racism? I do not know. I cannot and I will not judge that question. Am I and my colleagues at Congress College in need of additional training in order to overcome unconscious bias and prejudice? Perhaps. I shall address the existence of systemic prejudice at Congress College below. Would the, matching, would the watching of the videos that our leadership has mandated harm me? Would I benefit from them? Certainly the answer to the first question is no, and the answer to the second question is perhaps, possibly. My quarrel is not so much with the content of these materials uh, the administration would impose on us, but rather the coercive imposition itself. As an aside, however, I must admit that I'm already quite familiar with the videos in question and the other materials produced by the company employed by our quote-unquote Office of Diversity and Inclusion. They are at worst inoffensive and at best anodyne. But the administration must be either naive or disingenuous uh, to deny that there is an ideological content and substructure to this material. Does the urge to impose upon us this material derive from a sincere desire to free the college and its members from bigotry or from a felt need on the part of our leadership and throughout the academic world, truth to tell, to impose an ideological conformity which, makes its, which masks itself as an embrace of diversity? For that, I refer to a fine review of the book on diversity uh, by Barton Swain, uh, entitled Conformity Rebranded in the Wall Street Journal on June 10th, 2020. Again, with respect to the character of the statements of my leadership, uh, I do not know and I cannot and will judge. As a kind of preference to my explanation of my refusal to comply with the administration's diktat, let me remind you of several unpleasant facts 
from Jewish history. Even though the Apostle Paul in Romans in the New Testament teaches that liberty is perhaps the most precious effluent of faith in the resurrected Christ, and even though the prophet Muhammad warns in the Quran that there must be no compulsion in religion, quote unquote, Jews repeatedly during the last two millennia were subject to horrific persecution at the hands of Christian and Muslim authorities. In particular, from 1100 to 1500 in Christian lands, Jews were compelled to engage in forced disputations in order to demonstrate to them the falseness of the Jewish religion. The rabbis and Jewish leaders who were engaged in these quote-unquote debates did not respond with violence or vandalism, but rather summoned dignity and firmness in the rational defense of their faith, often at the risk of an actual torture, a a a suffering of torture, imprisonment, or public shaming for themselves, and the imposition of civil penalties, expulsion, or even extermination for their communities. Simultaneously free and unfree, these courageous individuals shine as examples of the power of the free mind to overcome the deprivation of reason, the deprivation of freedom, of the power of the human spirit to triumph over coercion. If you want to follow a reference to these, I refer to the disputation by the great rabbi Nachmanides, compelled by King Ferdinand and Isabella to engage in one of these such uh, uh, disputations, and from a very interesting and rigorous work called Faith Strengthened, Chizuk Emuna in Hebrew, by the great um, uh, uh, Karite scholar Isaac Troki in the 1500s. In the defense of themselves and their faith, I hope to follow their example. Is there systemic racism at Converse College? I might say that there's an accompanying question. Is there systemic anti-Semitism at Converse College? For most of my 34 years at Converse, I have been its only Jew, certainly its only Orthodox Jew. A year after I arrived in 1986, one of my colleagues in the religion department asked if I would conduct a model Seder for her class, which I was happy to do, of course. She invited a reporter from the local Spartanburg Herald Journal newspaper, and the paper subsequently pa- published an account of the Seder with information about me and my background. I received shortly thereafter a prompt and enthusiastic letter from the Ku Klux Klan of the Upstate, questioning the appropriateness of my teaching at the college. I'll read that letter to you now. So, in the spring of 1987, when I had been at Congress a year in, in the circumstances I just narrated, this I received this letter. And by the way, the Jewish uh, community, uh, uh, which I was a member of at that time, said that the rabbis, the prior rabbis, had often received this letter from the same individual. Dear Rabbi, I'm not a rabbi again, although I play one on television. That's a joke that if you're over 20 year old, you, you know. Dear Rabbi, Just a short note to let you know that we don't like Jews. We don't like to see you, hear you, eat with you, or have you to our homes. You are the greasiest, most dangerous hate group in the world, having committed as many atrocities as over the years as the Nazis. In the United States, you lead the mafia, provide its brains, deal in pornography, prostitution, and drugs, and every manner of filth. You make nice cities into slums so that you can profit from your crooked real estate deals. You control our media, our academe, and much of our politics, not so much because you are able, but because you have no morals. You will do anything to get ahead. You teach to your children that the commandments apply only to Jews. You teach that Jews can do anything to a goy, a non-Jewish person, and it is okay. Even murder. You all stick together and tell lies together and make more noise and fuss and talk over nothing than 10,000 normal people. You are not intelligent by, but, but hyperactive and hyperaggressive, and most of you are as psychopathic as Hitler. You hate America as you hated Germany. Your citizens spy on us. You trick our president. Your crooked brokers like Boski trick Wall Street and make innocent middle America go bankrupt. Your politicians tricked our president. You are dual loyalists, all of you. 
Israel comes first and the USA is your enemy. You are draft evaders and objectors during the Vietnam War. You only fight for Israel. You supported and built communism in Russia to bring down the Tsar in 1917. Now, finding communism is anti-Semitism too, you're still in more trouble. Trouble, trouble, always trouble. Because you are the people who persecuted Christ and you still call him the Tola, the unspeakable one. You're not a religion, but a cult. Your silly ritual makes no more sense than the Bhagwam Rajneesh and his gurus. Just what you are doing at Congress College, teaching decent young ladies, we really cannot fathom. Something needs to be done about it. You need to be out on a street corner to stand on a soapbox like the Moonies and the people who think that the world is flat. Your religion is right from the lunatic fringe. The Holocaust did exist, but we Poles and Russians suffered far more than you. About one million Jews were slaughtered, and this was wrong. But most of the rest of you emigrated to the United States where you set up every form of sordid criminal enterprise you practiced in Europe. When you came into real power, America declined as a nation as your drugs and venereal disease took their toll. You Jews know better, too. You never use drugs or alcohol yourselves. You are not homosexuals or perverts. But you have created all these vices to sell to Christians in your hope to exploit and destroy our youth. We don't like you, Abba Polvorti. We don't like your people. Why don't you go back to Israel, which we gave you, and stay and make trouble among yourselves and leave us alone? I must say that I was encouraged by the shock and horror of my colleagues here at the college regarding this ironic display of Southern hospitality. I realized that I had made a mistake in reading the letter to my mother, who lives in my home state of Illinois, when she gasped and whispered, quote, Jeff, you've got to get out of South Carolina. Unquote. Well, I didn't. I stayed put and allowed my life to unfold here. As Congress's only traditional Jew, I have often played the role of informal faculty advisor to Congress's Jewish students. Over the years, I've heard many tales of non-Jewish students constantly berating our Jewish students for not believing in Jesus or demanding them to display their horns. Talk to Michelangelo about that one. As the, faculty's advi the faculty advisor for many years of Congress's Association of African American Students, I listened to many of our black students pouring their hearts out to me about the abuse and prejudice that they faced from many of our white students. I counsel them to summon patience and to bear with the occasional departures of the college's inhabitants from the college's ideals. I did this in the conviction that the best way to enable our students to overcome the challenges and of religious and racial bigotry was to provide for them a genuine and rigorous liberal education which would equip them with the intellectual depth and spiritual fortitude to follow the lead of Booker T. Washington. As paraphrased by my great professor Herbert J. Storing, Washington, and all the other great minds that constitute the canon of liberal learning, could teach our students that dignity, quote, dignity and self-respect are not within the gift of any man, nor any law, and to deny that a man consists of his psychological reactions to the psychological prejudices of those around him, or her, and that was my uh, own emendation at the end. That is, by the way, from Storing's essay on Booker T. Washington and the School of Slavery, republished in a collection of his essays, A More Perfect Union, from pages 204 to 205. For many years at Congress, I have been the constant recipient of criticism and disparagement from fellow faculty and even administrators regarding my adherence to traditional Judaism. I have frequently been accused of being unprofessional or lacking in commitment to the college or in devotion to my students because of canceling or rescheduling classes that conflicted with Jewish holidays or because of my non-participation in admissions events or ceremonies such as graduation that occurred on the Sabbath. Once, when I was falsely suspected of failing to submit my senior grades on time enable to enable students to graduate, uh, seniors to graduate in the following Saturday of finals week. 
on time because of observing the festival of Pentecost, one of the college's administrators remarked, not to me, but concerning me, and re reliably reported to me the following day that, quote, we are under no obligation to respect that man's religion, unquote. I was furious, but I did not react with threats of hurling bricks through the college's windows or torching its buildings or even employing legal action against it, a recourse available to me that was not available to my Jewish predecessors. Instead, upon my department chair's ministrations and because of the respect and even affection for the, that I bore to the parties involved, I swallowed my anger and maintained my silence. One might have thought that providing Jew students the opportunity to behold an Orthodox Jewish professor laying out a careful, attentive, respectful, and perhaps even loving exposition of the New Testament or the Quran might itself constitute the very embodiment of the Founders' embrace of a, quote, truly tolerant and liberal Christianity, unquote. One of my students once remarked in a course evaluation, quote, I just wish my pastor could preach Jesus as good as you, unquote. One might have concluded that such an experience might outweigh the occasional inconvenience of a missed class or admissions event, and that perhaps, and perhaps constitute an experience of quote-unquote diversity and inclusion that would outweigh the washing of a hundred videos touting diversity and inclusion. But evidently some faculty and some administrators do not agree. I'm also a Republican and a political conservative. I will not rehearse here the utter lack of intellectual and ideological diversity and the distressing intolerance of conservatives that tend to predominate in American universities, in the American academic universe, and to some degrees even at Congress. Here's a brief example from my own experience. After the unfortunate death from cancer of one of our esteemed colleagues in the English department, Karen Carmine of Blessed Memory, who taught film, I conceived of a fitting memorial to her which would also enhance the college's culture, the quote-unquote Carmine film series. The idea was that several times a year one of our faculty, but also the staff and administrators, would present a favorite film and lead a discussion of it. I worked very hard to bring this idea to fruition and indeed supervised the series for five years. At the inaugural, at the inaugural reception and first film, several faculty and administrators rose and urged me publicly not to, to allow my political beliefs to mar Karen's memory or the integrity of the series. I, I admit I felt hurt and hangry, angry and unappreciated and humiliated, but I said nothing lest the jocularity of the event be overturned. I'm absolutely certain that had I been a progressive or a Democrat, no such comments would have been made or tolerated. I challenge anyone to examine the films presented over the life of the series to see if a political or ideological bias was evident. Again, where was Congress's embrace of diversity and inclusion? Congress College, like the American nation around it, is an imperfect entity, as must entity engen any entity engendered by the broken and corrupt human heart be. Converse and America may contain dark and ugly elements that frustrate the attainment of our highest ideals, but in life, in life, we must never confront our lowest by abandoning our highest. Unfortunately, this is exactly what the leadership of Converse College has done by imposing the coercive mandate and embracing an expedient to address the problem of racism that departs from the essential nature of a liberal arts education. The administration has simultaneously invoked and abandoned a, um, the Founders' ideals. How? By employing one of the ideals in abstraction from the other two. Dexter Edgar Converse hoped to create an institution that would encourage its members to see clearly, decide wisely, and act justly, quote-unquote. See clearly, decide wisely, and act justly. I've always loved these words because in my mind they encapsulated perfectly the meaning of a liberal education. 
but liberal derives from liberty. The enlightened mind cannot emerge, cannot escape from ignorance and prejudice without freedom of thought. No freedom, no clarity or wisdom. No clarity or wisdom, justice. Without clarity and, and wisdom, justice degenerates into self-righteousness, intolerance, and moral indignation. As the political philosopher Leo Strauss reminds us, quote, Indignation is a bad counselor. Our indignation proves at best that we are well-meaning. It does not prove that we are right, unquote. This is from his work, Natural Right and History, on page 6. I do not dispute that the leadership of Converse College is well-meaning in its attempts to extirpate bigotry, but those attempts must occur within the framework of a liberal education, guided by an essential respect for the freedom and dignity of the individual to think and learn on his or her own. I do not tell President Newkirk or Provost Barker what to read or watch or think. I demand the same respect from them. What am I recommending? By all means, let the leaders of Converse College continue to address the problems of racial bigotry according to their lights. Let them express their opinions on these grave matters and let them encourage the members of the college community to engage in debates and discussions based on materials that our leaders recommend and even urge. And God willing, let them see beyond ideology and embrace the complexity and diversity of opinions and interpretations that these events require. And finally, let them check their coercive impulses at the front gate of the college. The administration has not specified how it will enforce its mandate. Will it prohibit me from assuming my teaching duties? Will it ban me from Congress's administrative structures or its public ceremonies? Will it bar my access to the internal means of communication of the college? Will it attach a reprimand to my professional record? Will it lower or cut off my salary? Will it terminate my position? Whatever comes. I believe that I have done the proper and correct thing by refusing to comply with this coercive mandate and by sharing with you my reasons for my decision. I have tried to follow the example of my Jewish predecessors by meeting coercion with dignity and firmness. With all of its imperfections, I still love the college. I have enjoyed here a long and a good life, both professionally and personally. Although my nearly four decades at Converse have sometimes seen controversy and turbulence, most of my time here has been characterized by joy and excitement of pursuing the life of the mind through free inquiry, scholarship, and teaching. Converse College stands poised at present to transform itself into something other than what it has been. I hope and I pray that what will engineer that change and transformation is merely a change of name, the addition of a few graduate programs, and the admission of men to the undergraduate student body, and not by the abandonment of the college of its soul. That's my letter. And I sign it, respectively, Jeffrey J. Polvorty, Associate Professor of Politics, Department of History and Politics at Congress College. So, why did I write this and disseminate this letter uh, to the members of my college community? First of all, I really believe what I said. I have a profoundly different interpretation of the issue of race in America or the college and the events that unfolded and overtook our country during this turbulent time. Um, I also really do believe that it's a mistake uh, to impose through coercion uh, this mandate on the college faculty and employees. Um, you might think, by the way, that perhaps I might be caught in inconsistency. Um, an angry letter from a, a student, by the way, which um, uh, accused me of being a racist, more about that in a minute, also said, doesn't Professor Pavorty require readings in his class? How is that different? 
let me just explain. Uh, the premise of a professor having authority to require his or her students to read readings is actually based on the nature of the unequal relationship between a professor and his students. Uh, what I uh, suggested to this student was, if she wanted to learn medicine and went to a medical school, uh, my guess is she would submit to the requirements of the medical faculty. And would she want to go to a doctor who had gone to a medical school where the students told the faculty what they should, in fact, teach? Or if you wanted to learn an instrument, like the piano, and went to a master piano teacher and player, uh, would you expect to tell the piano teacher how to teach you his or her subject? Um, it's not that I'm arguing, by the way, that professors are superior human beings to their students. God knows. Uh, I've seen bums and jerks and dogmatic bigots assume the pulpit in the classroom, so to speak. I had a professor in graduate school who regularly came to class drunk and passed out before us once. I'm not arguing that professors are superior human beings, God forbid, but the premise of the relationship between professor and student in a liberal arts education is that students are unfinished in their experience and understanding of the world, and the point of professors is to lay in front of them materials to help them overcome that and to achieve the dignity and freedom from ignorance and prejudice that constitutes the fruits of a liberal education. Um, in some ways, to require a student to do readings is to respect the integrity and identity of the student at that point in his or her life. But for a college president and provost to require professors and faculty to do it, it isn't be that professors and faculty can't benefit from improvement, God forbid, of course. But you have to understand that in a liberal arts community, the assumption is that there's a kind of integrity of egalitarianism between the faculty. We are understood to be a community of scholars and teachers. And our leadership, by the way, sort of primer inter pares, the first among their equals, uh, the pre premises, although they certainly have managerial authority over us, and I would never presume to do what President Newkirk does in submitting a, an extensive budget or managing a complex organization with contrary human beings. But when it comes to the issues that we teach and our status as faculty, um, and for that matter, our capacities to think as moral and thoughtful beings, the premise is that the leadership of a college is among colleagues. And therefore, to tell a colleague, to mandate what a colleague must read, is in fact showing a sign of disrespect. So where you tell students to do readings respects their integrity to tell a colleague or to order a colleague to undergo mandatory diversity and inclusion bias training is in fact a sign of disrespect and I think undermines the premise of the uh, meaning of a liberal arts institution in college. Second, in writing this letter and disseminating it to the public, I saw it as a form of self-protection. I still don't know how the college intends to enforce this mandate, as I mentioned above, and I figured that the more awareness that other members of the college had of what the college administration may plan to do, and even the public, I'm not a, I'm not a hog for publicity or attention, but the truth of the matter is, the more that other members of the college were aware of my motives and my actions, and the more that the public was aware of what the administration might do, the more leverage it might give to me and more pressure it might put on them not to enforce this very bad idea. Third, I have to say that I anticipated that pretty soon after the dissemination of this letter would come the inevitable branding of me as a racist, and it did. So in some ways, I wanted to tell you enough about myself in this letter to show that, for instance, I understand what it's like to be uh, marginalized and, uh, and uh, criticized for being a minority in a minor majority culture. 
And it wasn't an accident that I mentioned that I was the faculty advisor of the Association of African American Students. It's true that no human being can ever fully get into the skin and experience of another human being. But the premise of a liberal education is that uh, between people of goodwill and a desire to learn the truth about life and amongst themselves, ultimately, a liberal education, while it doesn't turn you into an angel or a prophet or even a philosopher, that a liberal education can help you escape from the insularity of your own situation and understand that of others. So in some ways, I talk about myself in this letter, not because, again, I'm trying to establish myself as the star of the show, or I'm so self-referential, or that I'm even attempting to engender pity, but rather to show that I am not without experience and understanding of what it means to be the recipient of prejudice. Fourth, as I said, I wanted to establish a certain amount of personal credibility to speak on these issues, and in some ways a credibility not simply because I'm Jewish or because I was the faculty advisor for black students, but rather a personal credibility that came from the essential task of what I do at a college, and that is to provide a liberal education. Um, also, to some degree, I wanted to make the argument that if the aim of the college is diversity and inclusion, by example and by teaching, I could more efficaciously demonstrate and embody that than, frankly, these rather superficial and childish and trite videos. Last, I wanted to suggest that in admitting that there had been perhaps anti-Jewish feeling at my college, um, and perhaps even racial bigotry at my college, that because racism and anti-Semitism existed among members of the college, that did not mean that the college was systemically, systemically, which means what? Systemically must mean the inclusion of all the dynamics of a system, its whole and parts, and that on every level and part of the system in the institution, uh, bigotry or prejudice or racism exists. That would truly constitute systemic racism or anti-Semitism. But simply because there are anti, there are some people who harbor anti-Semite, Semitic beliefs or prejudices, does not make the college anti-Semitic. Because there might be some prejudice among students at Converse towards black people or other racial and ethnic minorities, does not make the college systemically racist. It should not be lost on you at this point that I think the same thing is true of America and police departments and other institutions of American life. Last year, one of the grisliest public events was the public murder of 11 elderly Jewish people, most of them Holocaust survivors, by a murderer at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Is there anti-Semitism in America? Yes. Is America systemically anti-Semitic? No. Is there racism in America or in police departments? Yes. Although, if you are conscientious and open-minded, you will follow the facts and the truth. And you will see that indeed, over the last 10 years, 20 years, our country has engaged in vigorous attempts to extirpate and limit through both legal, institutional, and certainly cultural means. You must understand that there's a limit to what a liberal regime, a free society, can do to eliminate evil and prejudice within its midst. It may be that many Americans harbor prejudice, perhaps even act on it. I won't deny that. But you can't undermine the liberty that is the promise of American life by assuming totalitarian authority over the inner life of America's citizens, in the same way that the administration of a college cannot assume totalitarian authority over the inner life of its faculty. So that is why I wrote the letter and included the elements that I did. And that is why I disseminated it to the college community and to the world beyond, including, of course, you, the patient observer and auditor of this video. Thank you.